Welcome to the Ottawa International Writers' Festival. Our 2020 virtual season is broadcasting from the unceded and unsurrendered territory of the Algonquin Anishinaabe. Hello and welcome to the Ottawa Writers' Festival. My name is Paul Wells, and I'm very pleased today to have as my guest Anne Applebaum, who is the author of Twilight of Democracy, The Seductive Lure of Authoritarianism. Uh, Anne Applebaum is one of uh, the most distinguished uh, um, historians and politicians uh, writing uh, in American and other media today. She started this year uh, as uh, a staff writer for The Atlantic Monthly after having written for The Washington Post for 17 years. She's been an editor at uh, Spectator magazine in the UK, and she's a senior fellow of the Agora Institute at Johns Hopkins University. Her uh, previous books have included uh, Iron Curtain, uh, winner of the Cundill Prize and a finalist for the National Book Award, and Gulag, which was a winner of the Pulitzer Prize for Nonfiction and a finalist for three other major prizes. She lives in Poland with her husband, Radek Sikorski, a Polish politician, and their two children. And she joins me uh, now from her country home in Poland. Anne Applebaum, welcome. Thank you. Um, this is a different kind of book for you. I mean, the, the, the other books that I mentioned about the Gulag and the, um, the uh, Soviet sphere of influence in Central Europe, the, the, these, those were you know, deeply reported, uh, essentially popular histories. Uh, this is much more personal and, and, and much more in the form of an essay. What inspired you to write it? Well, I mean, you, you, you put your finger on it exactly. So my previous books were, my history books were books about, you know, big moments in history. And one of the, um, one of the things I tried to do in all of them actually was to show those events from different perspectives, you know, from the perspective of whether it was the gulag, from the perspective of prisoners, of guards, of people in Moscow, of people in the Kremlin. Um, you know, I, I, I used a huge range of, sources, you know, memoirs and archives and all kinds of different things in order to, to, to try and see the event from as objective and as honest a perspective as possible. Um, when I was writing this book, I did almost the opposite. Um, it is an incredibly subjective book. It is written from my point of view. Um, that's partly because I'm a kind of actor in some of the events and my husband is an actor in some of the events. Um, and I felt that it was more of a personal exploration of things that have happened to me and people I know over the last two decades, and that it was more useful to try not to pretend that I have some kind of objectivity about it. I mean, it is not a history of the last 20 years. It's not a political science text. It doesn't come up with a single thesis or an explanation. Um, it's just a collection of stories and um, you know, d descriptions of people I know interspersed with you know, my reading things I've read and people I've met and 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 things that I've thought about, you know, while while contemplating this subject. Um, and so it is a completely you're right. It's a it's a it doesn't aim to have that kind of, you know, magisterial objectivity that my history books have tried to have. So um, in a lot of ways, I assume that makes your life a lot easier, right? You don't have stacks of files that you have to refer to and 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 and, you know, write endnotes for. Um, was it harder in other ways? Is it more, do you feel more exposed? Sure. I mean, anytime you write about yourself, I mean, it's not so much about me personally, but it is about people I know and, um, you know, friends I've had and so, so on. So yeah, in some ways it, it was more difficult. I mean, um, I, it's hard to compare actually. I mean, it, you know, how do you compare putting together hundreds of sources in order to write a terrible story like the story of the Ukrainian famine. That was one of my book, uh, another book, which I found really difficult. And how do you compare kind of lying on your sofa, staring at the ceiling and trying to think, what do I really think about this? You know, there's a sort of different kind of thought process. Um, but I mean, they're difficult in different ways. Um, and I mean, this one I have, I, you know, it's a book that I'm aware people, some people aren't going to like. Um, and I, it's not really intended to be everybody's cup of tea. And so I'm actually quite more, a little bit more distance from it in a way it makes it easier. I mean, I, you know, when, when my, when a big history book comes out that I spent a decade working on, you know, I read every single review and I worry about them and so on. I mean, this time it's kind of, well, okay, some people are going to like it. Some people aren't going to like it. And 
that's it. You know, there's nothing I can do about it. So in a way, I found it, I found it easier. Okay. For people who are just learning about the book through this uh, conversation, let's discuss the, the thesis. It is essentially that something has gone wrong in um, uh, the Western world or in the sort of North Atlantic world over the last decade or so. And, and, and its manifestation is a kind of a creeping de-democratization or authoritarianism um, that uh, manifests itself in different ways in different places but uh, is is becoming alarming. Is that uh, a pretty good capsule summary? Yeah, that's a capsule summary. I mean, to be clear, a lot of the book is about what used to be the center right and the radicalization of a part of the center right into into and the the transformation, including of some people I know from I don't know anti-communists or Reaganites or Thatcherites into something a little bit more extreme and radical. Um, and the book traces, tries to explain that. Um, and in the course of that also tries to explain why it is that people have become disillusioned with mainstream politics and therefore with democracy uh, itself and um, why some of the, you know, the, the, the institutions as they, as they were from the 1990s onward have become either boring or insufficient or, um, you know, or, or, or insufficiently inspiring to some people um, and why people are beginning to toy. Some people who, who, as I say, used to be in the in the absolutely mainstream center right, why some of them have begun toying with other ideas. You know, could you know, do we really need this two party system? Do we really need, um, you know, once we come to power, do we really need to, to, to preserve this level playing field? You know, why should we do that, given that we are the patriots and our opponents are traitors um, and there's a there's a there's a change in the way people have begun to talk about politics I mean actually one of the characters in the book who's a, a Spanish kind of eminence Gris um, says it the best and he's somebody who has who became very disillusioned with the Spanish center right and is now one of the founders of a of a more radical nationalist movement in Spain called Vox and he said to me you know politics now feels to me like it's winner take all and you know we just want to stay alive we don't want to be eliminated. Um, and and he said that, and I think I think a lot of people feel that in different ways. And there there's this sense that uh, you know either you take all the power, um, or someone else will take all the power. Um, and of course, once you have that attitude, and once that's how you understand the political system, then um, you know then then your behavior changes quite dramatically. Um, I mean, that's an interesting phenomenon that radicalization begets polarization, and and people. Um, uh, stop playing by the rules because they don't feel they have the luxury of doing that. I mean, that actually describes a lot of recent political events and even as genteel a precinct as Canada. But your book begins in a place where it's, it's it, the process has been stark, which is where you live in Poland. Um, you uh, have lived there off and on for many years. Your husband was foreign minister, you know, not that long ago in Poland. And a lot of the um, people who used to be in your social circle, the the sort of um, uh, center right, which is the political center of gravity in Poland, I think, um, have have moved to a much more extreme, almost cartoonish right, which which governs and uh, and actually just 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 won a, a presidential election there. Um, yeah, I mean, so I mean, in, in in a way, I mean, certainly in 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 my in this, what happened in Poland is the most dramatic. Um, of of the of the countries that I describe, so this is, you know, and, and I begin the party in Poland in 1999 um, at a party in this house, the one that I'm at now, and and then I reflect on the fact that some of the people at the party no longer speak to other people who are at the party, and in fact, you know, would would cross the street to avoid them, um, and that these are these divisions are not personal; they're political, and they're quite profound, and there has been this deep split in society, um, which is. Poland is, I think, one of the most polarized societies in Europe um, in terms of what people read and see and how they interpret the world. And some people that I know have become part of what you can only call an extreme nationalist right um, that feels no qualms about using anti-Semitism and homophobia in its election campaigns. This isn't the, the kind of shadowy, you know, dog whistly version that we sometimes get in North America. This is very open. 
you know, if you, you know, vote for us or the Jews will come back from America and take your money kind of thing. Um, and people I know who, who were at my house, um, you know, 20 years ago are part of that, those, you know, that kind of propaganda. Um, some of them work for, and Polish state television is now, um, you know, it's no longer, you know, it was founded to be something like, or intended to be something like the BBC or CBC, uh, some kind of centrist, mushy institution in which, you know, all voices were heard. And it has now become really quite extreme um, one party propaganda, ruling party propaganda. It's hard to describe to outsiders, but I mean, you have to imagine if CBC were taken over by a tiny group of, I don't know, far left or far right wing fanatics um, and began broadcasting in that tone um, through all of its channels um, all over the country, you know, you would really feel it and it would it, it, it would it would bother you. And the same thing has happened in Poland, where you have this I mean, the whole tone of national discourse has been changed um, by that, just by that one move. And that's, of course, not the only thing they've done. And there are people who we know who are now, who work for that, now work for Polish state television and are part of that kind of propaganda machine, you know, in which they, they, they run series of, they'll do, they'll do kind of item after item about particular politicians, attacking them, smearing them, accusing them of things that aren't proven. Um, they've attacked me, I mean, which I, I explain in the book. Um, they, they were in, in, the, in the early days when this, this party, it's called Law and Justice, took power. Um, one of the things that happened was that Poland, which has had actually had incredibly good press for 20 years, I mean, since 1989, the story of Poland has been one of economic growth and political stability. Um, and so everybody kind of got used to the idea that everyone abroad writes nice things about us. Um, and when they took over, and especially when they began to attack the judiciary and attack the state media and, you know, and, and, and you know, undermine some of the system, they began to get bad press. Um, and they needed to somehow explain this to their constituents. And the way they chose to explain it was that it must be my fault, me, you know, because, because I'm a journalist and I'm married to the former foreign minister and therefore I control what's written in, you know, the AP, Reuters, Le Monde, Süddeutsche Zeitung, um, you know, the Globe and Mail, the New York Times and the Wall Street Journal, you know, and that was, and anytime anything about Poland appeared, there was, it even became a kind of joke. Oh, Anne Applebaum must have you know, must have been talking to them. And I mean, it was ridiculous, but it was, um, it was weird to see myself described that way, you know, more than once actually on national state television, as well as on the cover of some of these far right magazines. Um, so there, you know, and, and that's done by, again, the, the, the milieu that has created that kind of propaganda um, is, includes people who we used to know. And uh, part of the sort of pleasure of having you as our social um, convener going through these corridors is that you, you can point out some of these relationships. The two brothers, Jacek and Yaroslav Kursky, one of whom, uh, Jacek, the younger one, runs the, the, the state broadcaster and essentially the government's propaganda arm. Yaroslav is an editor at uh, the leading... He's the editor. The he's, editor the, he's the editor-in-chief of, yeah, editor of the main liberal newspaper, which is called Gazette of Borges. So this shows you how this political divide runs through families. I mean, those are there. I talk about the brothers in my book because they're, they're a very interesting example. They're, they both come from Gdańsk. They were both kind of teenage solidarity activists in the 1980s. They both marched in demonstrations. Um, Yarek went to prison once, um, you know, was, was in, in, when he was in his, I don't remember his late teens or early 20s. Um, and they are, and they were both people who in the 1990s immediately threw themselves into the project of rebuilding Poland in the post-communist era. And, you know, of course, if you'd asked anyone, if you, you know, in, in 1993, you know, are, are the two Kursky brothers on the same side? Well, of course they were, you know, I mean, they were interchangeable. Um, and now they're so far apart, um, you know, that they run these completely different institutions. And of course, they no longer speak to each other um, and they don't have anything to do with one another. And that's, but that, that, that division now runs through a lot of Poland. I mean, we have close friends who are neighbors who live near us in the country. And they, you know, the, one of them, the, 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 the wife doesn't speak to her parents for exactly the same reason. You know, it's kind of conversation has become impossible because of the political differences. Um, and it, it's very typical, you know, around Poland. But of course, you know, I don't have to tell you, you know, that's very typical in the United States now, you know, for people to, to be in completely different political 
space from their parents. Um, it happened, I saw it happen in Britain during the Brexit campaign. You know, again, Brexit absolutely sliced through social circles. I mean, people who were, um, you know, for, you know, best of friends or, or, or acquaintances, you know, suddenly found themselves on absolutely opposite sides. Um, so it was very similar. It had a very similar impact. Um, and one of the things that, as I saw this kind of polarization happening, you know, in, in, in the countries that I know best, um, one of the things I did was I went back and looked up other moments in history when this had happened. You know, I thought, well, you know, how did people behave then? Um, and I talk in the book a little bit about the Dreyfus trial um, and the Dreyfus case in France, which is an, exactly the same kind of moment. So again, the, this is for those who know, I mean, or don't know, this is a, the uh, Alfred Dreyfus was a, was a Jewish officer in the, in the French army. This is the very end of the 19th century, um, who was accused of treason and actually convicted and sent away, um, you know, to, a, to, to, to prison, um, even though he was innocent. And uh, French society, you know, including people who had won, hitherto been on the same side, you know, people who were affiliated with the army or with, you know, with the aristocracy, absolutely split down the middle into people who felt that Dreyfus was guilty and those who felt that he wasn't guilty. And the split reflected, you know, some people believed that, you know, they were in a, in a sort of mythical, mystical idea of the French state in which someone like Dreyfus would never fit in and in which if the army accused him, it could never be said to be wrong and therefore we owe it loyalty and therefore Dreyfus is guilty. And on the other side were people who believed in a more abstract idea of the state, that there was such a thing as justice and equal treatment of citizens and Dreyfus was a citizen and therefore deserved to be treated equally. And these two camps, you know, these kind of two visions of the French state um, um, persist actually, um, you know, all the way through the 20th century. Um, and you can follow them. Um, and the and the more or less, I mean, I, I, I don't want to generalize too much, but the the, the so-called anti-Dreyfusards evolve eventually into Vichy. I mean, they're the people who collaborated with the Germans because they believed in preserving some idea of Frenchness during the Nazi occupation. And then, um, you, you know, and then after the war, the sort of anti-Dreyfusards, I mean, sorry, the Dreyfusards come back and reestablish the Republic, which is a, you know, a secular... Um, you know, a modern secular vision of France, um, but the but the battle goes on, um, and the French far right, you know, the Marine Le Pen's political party, which has gone by different names than um, used to be called the National Front, um, is advocating that sort of mystical sense of Frenchness um, to this day, and the and the different ideas of what France means and what it is have gone on battling one another for the last hundred years, um, and when I when I read through those histories. Um, I realized this is, you know, this kind of polarization and this this deep difference in society over, you know, who we are and what kind of country we live in is normal. I mean, this is what happens in most countries. And it was just that the moment I think of the nineteen of the nineteen nineties gave all of us, I think, you know, but particularly in Eastern Europe, you know, this false sense that now we have agreed on who we are and now we're going to move forward and we're going to you know build democracy and build capitalism and we're going to join the European Union and NATO and and we are defined you know we've escaped from communism and moved into something else but actually this was just a temporary hiatus um, and people who want to reverse that or pick it apart um, are still around and I mean I think Americans in particular have been um, complacent about the degree to which, um, there can be radically different interpretations of what America is. Um, you know, if you look back in history, I mean, maybe you have to be older in order to see this, but I mean, our civil war wasn't that long ago. You know, I mean, the 1860s in the grand scheme of things, mm -hmm. um, even in the 2020s, isn't that long ago. I mean, it was, you know, a hundred century and a half ago, something like that. Um, and that was a moment when the bitter differences and, you know, different arguments about who, what is the United States were so bitter that we split apart um, and it could happen again. And we've just kind of come to assume that that won't happen again. But of course, there's no reason why it wouldn't happen again. That's an interesting inversion, which you, which sort of comes out in the last several pages, really, of your book. The idea not that something novel and terrible is happening now, but that we... Um, people who believe in NATO and the European Union and, and things like that kind of got lucky for several years 
around the turn of the century and that the, the lucky streak has run out and that we've returned more to a kind of status quo ante than to something uh, novel or unprecedented. Um, the book darts around a, a bit. Or, um, it, it's got essentially four large uh, sections. The second one is in the, is in the UK. Um, look, obviously the UK is, is, is uh, going through a strange moment, but it's also not particularly authoritarian uh, or monolithic. No, I mean, you can, you can make fun of Boris Johnson all you want, and, and it's actually kind of trendy to do so, um, uh, without running into the sort of career danger that you do in Poland or in some circles in the United States. Um, but obviously, uh, as someone who believes in the, in the European project, Brexit is uh, wounding to you and, I, and, 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 and indicative of some broader trends, I take it. Well, it's, I mean, it's funny. I mean, I expected Brexit to succeed. I mean, I, I was unsurprised by the result. Um, partly because I, as you mentioned in your introduction, I, I worked for a magazine called The Spectator in England um, in, in the 1990s, which has always been the sort of in-house magazine of the Tory party in some way, or conserv you know, the intellectual bit of the Tory party anyway, yeah. um, or the, the part that writes articles and publishes them. Um, and, you know, and so I, I, I saw this mood coming for a long time, I mean, for two, you know, two decades. Um, and I was not surprised um, that Brexit won. I mean, the, you know, and, and you can also argue, and I think fairly, that the, you know, the Brexit vote is a little bit different. It's a little bit of a different circumstance from the from the one I describe in Poland. Um, you know, we it's 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 you know, it's not as directly linked to, uh, you know, the, you know, the authoritarianism as the as the Polish ruling party is. Um, but there is, you know, but the, the point of my book is that there are sort of four or five stories that are told and they don't all say the same thing, but there are these echoes from one to the next. And I think that one of the things that you see along with Brexit is this kind of revolutionary spirit and this desire to just, you know, kind of break up or smash institutions. Um, and you also see this, you know, a lot of some, a part of the Brexit vote came from um, people who were really disappointed with their own country, and they really didn't like the modern version of Britain. Um, and they disliked it for demographic reasons, they disliked it for economic reasons, they disliked it for sort of mere, kind of moral and spiritual reasons, um, and they wanted some kind of profound change. And they saw Brexit as the vehicle for that, you know, and so um, as a kind of vehicle for radical change. You know, whether it actually turns out to be that or not, I can't say. Um, but certainly in the, you know, we've all kind of forgotten this now because of the, of the pandemic, but certainly in the run-up um, to the last election, there were some ugly moments. You know, there was a moment when um, Boris Johnson's government suspended parliament um, in, a, in a very unprecedented and, um, you know, unsettling way. Um, there have been attacks on the courts and on the House of Lords. Um, attacks on the BBC, not unlike the kind that you hear in Poland. You know, we don't like this. You know, our state media is to, you know, we, we you know we need to re remake it. We need to make it more ideological, um, and so on. So there, some of the some of the instincts, some of the animus against institutions, even democratic institutions, that you can hear in other countries, you can also hear in Britain right now. Um, again, that doesn't mean that, you know, you see anything like yet. You know, the kinds of abuses of power that you have right now in the White House um, or in Warsaw. Um, but I, I think there's an echo of that mood. And, and as I said, the Brexit vote and the Brexit referendum certainly split um, British society in the same way as some of these other movements have. Um, you know, people who'd been previously friends suddenly found themselves on absolutely opposite sides of, of the divide. I mean, in, you know, for me, it's a little odd. I mean, I actually had friends on both sides. Um, and I, I think I've managed, in that case, I've managed to keep some of the friends on both sides. But I know other people who didn't. I mean, there were people who felt really strongly about it one way or the other um, and wound up being quite angry. So, so it's, it's had that radicalizing and divisive impact in, in Britain as well. And whenever um, uh, a phenomenon like this uh, pops up, it is tremendously attractive to other people in the movement. Like it tends to um, uh, bring other people along in its wake. Uh, the Canadian Conservative Party is extraordinarily uh, genteel and centrist and bland by by 
uh, almost any international standard. Yet, uh, I know several Conservative staffers who went to London to campaign for the Brexit side in the referendum. I know none who went to, to campaign for Remain. Daniel Hannum, who has a cameo role in your book, a sort of a stridently uh, uh, pro-Brexit Euro deputy, is a, a kind of a household god among Canadian Conservatives because he's flamboyant and 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 eloquent and loquacious and and, and says outrageous things and and um, it, it it it's awfully hard to combat that those sorts of arguments with well you know the European Union is an institutionalized compromise and you win some and you lose some meanwhile the other side seems to be having all the fun no it's true that the you know the right um, the radical right has um, I mean, for their, you know, there are a number of things that it's done well recently. I mean, I talk a lot in the book about its use of social media and its sort of deep understanding of the ways in which you can, you know, bend the truth and promote ideas and um, make yourself seem more popular and so on than you are online. And they kind of, some of them understood that before I think others understood it. Um, you know, and in, I don't, certainly not in the Canadian case, but in, in a number of, instances in Europe, it's because they were watching what was going on in Russia. And it was the Russians who were really the great path, path breakers in, in learning how to manipulate social media and manipulate algorithms in order to spread ideas or give the impression that extreme ideas were normal. I mean, that was that's really what we're talking about. Um, so they've been good at that. And also, I think, um, you know, they've had the they've had the radical edge, you know, it's always more interesting to be, you know, cutting edge and different than it is to be the establishment. Um, and they managed to characterize themselves as being some kind of avant-garde. And whereas everybody else, not just the left, but the center and the center right um, and the whatever, the remainers and the and the um, and the and the and people who have experience running the country, you know, in, in the United States, that all those people are you know, somehow corrupt or they're the establishment or the deep state. And that then gives them this special role And this. Yeah, they've been very good rhetorically um, at setting that up. I mean, quite a lot of them once in power have proved to be, you know, mostly quite incompetent. I mean, and for a reason, because they are, um, you know, they, you know, they were the people who were in, in often the people who were overlooked by previous governments. And you can see this absolutely in Boris Johnson's government. It's kind of government of people who failed in the past or were never considered good enough to be promoted. Um, and we see some of the effects of that right now. I mean, I, I don't know how closely your readership follows British politics, but kind of one mistake after the next made by incompetent ministers. And, you know, this is absolutely the story of um, Donald Trump's White House, you know, which is now full of second rate people who would never have got a job in a, in a, in a normal, more Republican administration. That wasn't true in the first two years, but it's, it's true now. Um, um, so, so it's not as if these are, you know, this this is a this is a better or more effective or more caring or more um, committed elite or an elite that really cares at all, in fact, about the people who voted for it. Um, but they have been good at, you know, at winning votes, at dividing people, at polarizing, and at, you know, at therefore making themselves into the avant garde. I mean, there's no question that they've won the. Um, they've won the propaganda war in recent years. Um, as I said, that has not proved, they've not, almost anywhere that I can think of actually, um, they've not proven themselves to be good administrators once they take power, but, but, they, but they talk a good game. Um, if I have a big question about all of this, I guess it would be, when did this start? I mean, sometime between 1999 and 2015, uh, the trends that you're describing developed a kind of a terrible momentum. How did it begin, do you think? I mean, I think it begins right away, actually. I mean, I think it begins, um, at, you know, after the Cold War. I mean, look, who were the Cold Warriors and what was the, you know, the, co the anti-communist coalition? You know, this was a pretty broad grouping of people. So some people were Cold Warriors because they were interested in realpolitik and they were worried about nuclear weapons and they worried about, I don't know, Russian influence in Europe. Um, some people were cold warriors because they were interested in democracy and human rights, and they were upset about the Soviet suppression of, you know, religious minorities or other kinds of minorities, or, or they were worried about abuse of, you know, abuse of power. 
Um, some people were cold warriors because they were Christians and the Soviet Union was atheist and they felt that it was you know, moral to push back against the Soviet Union for that reason. Well, one of the things that happens, I think already in the 1990s, is the members of those coalitions start realizing they don't have that much to do with one another. And they, you know, immediately there's some kind of scratchiness inside the Republican Party in America, um, inside the Tory Party in Britain um, and, and, and elsewhere. Um, probably the thing was kept together artificially by 9-11 because that felt like once again, a unifying moment um, when you know, we all need to band together for the sake of national security against this new challenge from radical Islam. Um, but you know, that hasn't lasted, um, partly because radical Islam is a weird kind of challenge and it, it's periodic and it's, you know, co comes and goes and it's, you know, the, 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 it, it's, not, it's, not, it's not unifying in the way that the Cold War once was. Um, but, but so I, I think it, you know, in fact began in the 90s and you can begin to see it gaining strength um, through the 2000s and, um, and then became particularly notable. I mean, as I think, you know, frankly, I think under the influence of Russian propaganda and the, the you know, the, the, the way the Russians learn to use um, social media and, you know, and they have a huge influence on the far right in Europe and the far right in Europe in turn had a huge influence on the, the right of the Republican Party as well. Um, and that really begins to pick up in 2013, 20, especially 2014, following the invasion of Ukraine and 2015. Um, and so I think that's the, I think 2013, 14 is a real turning point. Um, is there an extent to which if a lot of countries have handed over their leadership or, or, or have allowed their leadership to be seized by second raiders, as you call them, it, is it also partly because the, the first raiders, when they were in charge, weren't delivering great results, whether it's on uh, advancing so opportunity or, or, or uh, abolishing cronyism or what have you? Sure. I mean, yes, of course, there's another aspect of this, which is that the our democracies have grown weaker for a lot of reasons. And some of that is to do with um, elites and it's to do with the way I mean, in particular to do with, I think, money in politics both lobbyists and also the circulation of dirty money. I mean, the growth of kleptocracy, not just in the US, but around the world and its ill effect on, on power. Um, obviously, there's an element of it that's to do with the financial crisis, although then you also have to explain why the financial crisis is in 2008 and it's not for you know, another eight years before there's, there's an impact. Um, so, but, then the, but the financial crisis was a moment when a lot of people lost faith in the, at least in the economic competence um, of their governments. And so, so that's an important change. I mean, the, the big wave of immigration from the Middle East in 2015 is an important part of the story because for a lot of people, you know, that was a moment that the right seized on as a, you know, um, and played into people's fears of Islamic, again, Islamic terrorism or being overwhelmed by foreigners or, you know, whether it's, you know, fear, you know, whether you can legitimate fear of demographic change or whether it's racism, you know, we can argue about that. Um, but that, that was, you know, those were, those were other elements um, that have played into it. But you also have to be, um, you have to be careful with the economic arguments because really Poland um, is an example of a country that has, you know, for 20 years had constant growth. I mean, even after the financial crisis, there was, I mean, there was a kind of a, a small dip in the level of growth, but there was no recession. Um, and you had continuous growth and you had a continuous expansion and you had ever larger investment in infrastructure and in schools and, and so on. Um, and, you know, there was really, and, and this is, by the way, and this is affects all sectors of society, you know, not just the rich, but also the, the poor and the middle classes. Um, and you also have, Pol in Poland, you also have a country in which inequality was shrinking, you know, so it was kind of getting less and becoming more equal, partly thanks to do with the way EU money is spent in Poland and so on. So you needed, you need something more sophisticated than just an economic explanation. You know, you can't just say, this is about people who were left behind. Um, and the other point is my book is really not about voters. So it's not about why did voters lose, you know, lose their faith in whatever the Democratic Party in the U.S. or, um, or, or, the, or, the, or the Labor Party in Britain or, the, or the Tory, indeed the Tory Party in Britain. My book is really about the, the insiders, you know, the, the political strategists and the journalists and the conservative intellectuals. Um, and the people whose whose discontent and whose dislike of the way politics were going have been so important for you know in changing 
you know, in changing the nature of of, of, of politics. I mean, people like the one we, the man we were just talking about, Jacek Kurski, who's the head of state television in Poland. Um, and these, as a group, these are not deprived people or marginalized people. I mean, these are part of the elite. You know, they are educated. They went to good schools. Some of them speak foreign languages. They travel. This is not some kind of, with some exceptions, you know, this is not some kind of provincial seg seg segment of any of these countries. I mean, these are, you know, this is a part of the elite that was dissatisfied with the rest of the elite and wanted to push it out of the way. Um, and that's a very crude way to put it, but um, but that's essentially what we're talking about. So, I mean, I, you know, there is this almost, I mean, I, I almost think it comes from, you know, the kind of influence of Marxism on all of our thinking. You know, there is a desire um, that I, one hears all the time in, in Western countries to explain everything in terms of economics. Um, but this phenomenon, I think, doesn't, it doesn't fit neatly into economic explanations, particularly given the fact that a lot of these kinds of radical right parties, when they come to power, you know, aren't particularly good for the poorest in their societies. I mean, they don't, they don't then turn around. These aren't, this isn't Latin American populism, you know, which was about redistribution of wealth or anyway, throwing, throwing goods and money at, at the very poor, which is what happened in a number of Latin American countries. Um, you don't, this is not happening in, in, you know, anywhere in Europe or, or um, certainly not in the U.S. I mean, there is an element of it in Poland in which there is a, there has been a, there was a big, um, there was a big sort of social program that was created by the, by the Law and Justice Party, um, kind of, you know, sort of, of a very, very generous form of child benefit, um, which is, you know, which was very popular. Um, but most of the time, that's not the case. Um, that concentration on the sort of courtier class, the, 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 the people who would be in the corners of the painting of this were some sort of rich... Uh, tableau right. um, um, produces a book that's full of fascinating characters. Uh, I was uh, um, struck to come across John O'Sullivan, who is uh, a British journalist of a certain age, who's a, a very avuncular and 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 um, uh, yep. charming guy. And for two years, at the end of the '90s, he was helping to run the editorial pages at Conrad Black's Canadian paper, The National Post, where I worked. So I used to see O'Sullivan every once in a while. I was astonished to learn that he's now working for a sort of an emanation of the regime in Hungary, uh, a think tank that doesn't bother itself with too much thinking. And uh, uh, it's, it's, it's surprising where a lot of these people turn up. So, I mean, that's a, you know, I didn't, I've never really got to the bottom of why John is doing that, but he, he, yes, he is working for a, it's a government funded think tank. I mean, it, the money goes through another institution, but essentially it's a think tank funded by the Hungarian government. And the point of it is to sort of broadcast and, and explain Viktor Orban to the world. And John runs it and he's, his specialty is inviting people, you know, right-wing intellectuals to come to Budapest for events um, and, um, you know, and, 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 and do things there. And, you know, when he first started doing it, which was, goes back a few years, I mean, it was kind of an eccentric thing to do, but, you know, I don't know, maybe a nice, a nice, you know, final job. He's had a lot of different jobs in his life. Um, it's now really an odd, I think, I mean, given, given the nature of the Orban government, given the openness of its anti-Semitism, given the, um, the, the degree to which it's destroyed, um, the media in Hungary, I mean, this is not in Hungary, the question isn't just the state media, it's private media, which has been through a variety of tactics, whether it's tax pressure or undercutting advertising or spooking advertisers so that they don't, they don't support independent media. Um, they, they've managed to take over quite a bit of it. So quite a lot of the Hungarian media is now literally owned by the government. I think it's like 95%. Um, and then a part of it is, if it's not directly owned by the government, then it's owned by sort of oligarchs who are close to the government. And there are a few little exceptions left, but I mean, even recently one of those fell as well. Um, and so this attack on the on the media, this attack on um, on business, um, you know, Orban has kind of created, sort of forced a lot of independent businessmen out of the country and created a kind of oligarchic class around himself of people who are have got rich because of their relationships to him. Um, uh, you know, uh, you know the attack on the undermining of the courts and the constant pushing against court independence, and as well as actually, frankly, open cheating in elections. I mean, using various kinds of tricks to bump up his his support um, artificially, 
probably including some actual manipulation of results. Um, uh, and, and, you know, and all that is, has gone on without John being especially bothered by it. On the contrary, he defends Orban and has done so to me and does so in public and isn't all that embarrassed about it. And to me, this is a, is a really extraordinary change. I mean, he is somebody who was a, um, he was a Thatcherite, he was a Reaganite, he was a Cold Warrior. He wrote a good book actually about sort of John Paul II, Thatcher and Reagan. Um, he's somebody who, who very much sees himself as descended from that tradition. Um, and now he's working in the service of somebody who seems to me to be absolutely the opposite of that tradition. I mean, there's nothing about, you know, there's nothing about what Orban does that's about encouraging freedom or, um, you know, either political freedom or economic freedom or any other kind of freedom. So, um, you know, so for him, there's been a big transformation. And, you know, I, I, I didn't entire, I got, I interviewed him for the book. I didn't get an entirely satisfactory set of answers, but, um, but he, you know, he's one of a whole group of people who now have been so, um, what's the word? They're so, um, they're so angry at what they see as the, the, the left in, in their countries. They're so angry at the cultural left. They're so angry at mass immigration as they see it. Um, they're so angry at you know, the ways in which they see their societies have changed that they really are willing now to sit on exactly the opposite side and, and, they, and, and think that's better. Um, in, your, in, in your conversation with them in the book, uh, you go at them with the, the sort of mass concentration of state-owned media in Hungary that you described. And his answer is on the level of, well, CNN loves the Democratic Party, so what do you want? Uh, it, it's it, it's hard to have a conversation with someone whose terms of reference have become so estranged from yours. Yeah, I mean, it, it, it was kind of what aboutism. It's like, oh well, that's bad, but what about all these other bad things? And um, so it was a, it was a bit pointless. Okay, um, I I think I'm going to uh, begin to wrap this up. You've been very generous with your time. In the last pages of the book, I sense that you're trying to uh, end on a relatively optimistic note and that the current circumstance, a global public health crisis that's been worse, handled worse by some of the governments that you describe, uh, make that difficult. But is there something that individuals that um, uh, more democratic governments can do uh, to advance uh, a more pluralist vision of society? So the point about the ending of the book was that just as it was a major mistake for us to be complacent and to think that our societies would go on being democracies and the world would go on improving and things were always going to get better and none of us really had to do that much about it. We would just sit back and, I don't know, go to work for Goldman Sachs or you know, run a grocery store and everything would just tick on and po politics was a kind of something for professionals and they would work it out. I mean, just as that was a mistake. Um, I also think it's a mistake, this kind of really deep gloom that some people are in is also a mistake. You know, there's nothing we can do. Everything's ending. You know, it's all a disaster. Um, I mean, look, the, the, you know, politics and history have always been radically open. I mean, it, you know, big changes do happen all the time. Um, unpredictable things happen. Um, and I think it's really irresponsible, actually, for people, particularly for my people my age, to be pessimistic. I mean, it's, it's unfair to people who are younger than us to tell them that, you know, forget it, you know, the West is finished and it's all over. Um, and I, um, you know, I wanted to leave open the possibility that their generation will, will, will do great things and, and, and make things and make things better. I mean, and, you know, people have asked me a lot, you know, what can ordinary people do? I mean, I think the main point is that I think we've all forgotten how important it is in democracy for people to be engaged and doing things, by which I don't mean that you have to be in a political party if you can't stand the idea of that. Um, but at least, you know, participate in some civic organization or, you know, run for the local school board or, interest yourself in how your neighborhood works or, you know, you know, jo join a committee that thinks about how, you know, garbage disposal works. I mean, I don't want to, I, I don't want to, that's, that's a little, a little farcical, but, but the, the, you know, if, if we don't have people engaged and we don't have people 
paying attention. We don't have people thinking about politics and trying to make things happen on both local and national levels. Then, um, you know, then democracy does become very stale and empty and pro forma um, and kind of over professionalized. Um, and it seems to me that more, in, it's, you know, it's not just about voting, although of course voting is very important. It's also about finding some way in which you can be engaged with, you know, your 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 society and your community and your neighborhood. On that note, uh, Anne Applebaum, thank you for spending some time with us today. I appreciate it. Uh, Anne Applebaum, thank you. Anne Applebaum is the author of The Twilight of Democracy, The Seductive Lure of Authoritarianism. She spoke to us today from her Polish country home. I'm Paul Wells. Thanks for joining us.